Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. I'd like to introduce to you today one of those unique personalities in aerospace history who has not only lived and participated in history, but had the foresight to record it for those of us who didn't have the privilege to witness it. It is my pleasure to introduce this aerospace icon, Roy Wolford, who was the first company photographer for Jack Northrup, a close personal friend, and still today uh, a family friend of Jack Northrup family. And Roy, please don't forget to tell him about your bailout in the P-61 Black Widow. Thank you very much for being here. Roy, I just wanted you to know that um, Jack Northrup's son is here. I know. I used to first know John when his mother used to bring him out to the plant at night to see Daddy because Daddy was working some overtime too. John and his family. And we've been friends well, since the 30s. Yeah. And we've had a lot of experiences in different ways over the years. Yeah, I remember going in and, and um, into his lab and washing my Christmas cards, which were photographic. <laughs> so I, then running them through the dryer. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, we're uh, always willing to help a, a friend. <laughs> Thank you, John. I have started with Northrop in uh, January the 15th, 1934, when there were 220 people, including Jack Northrop and his dad. And uh, I spent 61 years and 40 of that, I started the first photo department and I was manager of that for about 40 years. And uh, it started as a result of my observing that the test pilots, when I started with the company, uh, used to take a notepad and strap it on their leg and take, a note, take notes with a pencil. They didn't always get the information that the engineers needed they'd have to refly flights. So I had a hobby of photography as well as my A&E license. So I suggested to Mr. Northrup that it, he'd let me fly with them. I would photograph the whole instrument panel and maybe we'd save some money on the reflights. I used to have a pilot's license. There were five of us that were in the company back there in the 39 and 40s so on. We were flying Staggerwing Beaches and Stinsons, Wacos and whatever else. And uh, one day we were sitting around. Sorry, I'm going to have you stand a little bit closer little close. to the mics. Okay. Um, we were sitting around having some coffee and somebody said, you know, we wear parachutes and nobody's ever used one and maybe it, we ought to make a jump so we'd at least know how to use it if we had to. <laughs> well, it ended up only two of us made the jumps. And over at Old Mines Field on Sundays, people would bring the kids out to watch the airplanes fly. And so we started making jumps on Sundays and eventually got to what today is called skydiving, and going up to 10,000 feet and falling for about 8,000, popping the chute. And then I started getting smarter, I thought, getting out of a Waco biplane and walking out on the outer lower wing out to the outer strut and come down over the runway at about 800 feet and pull the ripcord and the chute would drag me off and make about three oscillations and hit the runway. And we didn't have jump boots in those days. I had high tops tennis shoes and wool socks and I used to take and put two inch wide adhesive tape under my arches and pull it up about halfway to the knees and put the shoes and socks on and I was ready to go. <laughs> I'm going to start out and tell you a little bit about my background with Mr. Northrup first. He was probably one of the most inventive individuals of his day, uh, starting out with demonstrating uh, some of his ideas in the Lockheed uh, Vega, made with wood, and then converting it when he left Lockheed 
and went across the Burbank Airport and started experimenting with his Navy on, which you'll see a picture of that uh, showed his interest in flying wings. And then while there, they built the alphas and the betas and the gammas and uh, using the monocoque fuselage with metal and also the multicellular wing. And I'll show you some of those aircraft of that day. Now this picture, <laughs> if you count from the, your left, the eighth person, the little short guy, is me in 1929. That's the Goodyear blimp, the first one called the Volunteer. And out in the background is the Graf Zeppelin when it made its trip around the world. I had seen my first airplane when I used to live where I was born down in Blythe, California. And after World War uh, I, I saw a Jenny fly down over the main street of town. And that kind of set the stage for what my career was going to be, I guess. And the Boy Scouts, we volunteered to run messages and do a few things. And there were five of us that showed more than normal interest, I guess. We were taken out and got to go in the gondola of the Graf Zeppelin. So that was another inspiring event in my life. This shows me in my flight gear, standing up on the side of an F-89. Sometimes I would have two or three different kind of cameras with me. And this one was with a motion picture, 16 millimeter motion picture. I used to use different airplanes to photograph other airplanes. And um, I did 89s, T-33s, T-38s, B-17s, B-24s, taking the tail cones off of B-25s so I could lay down and shoot head-on shots. And this is in a B-25 in the waist gunner position. And this is the first Lockheed Vega when they rolled it out on the field. This was the prepared airport at Burbank. And it was interesting that in the engineering team that Mr. Northrop developed out there was Jerry Volte, who became famous in his own right later on. And Mr. Northrop had also worked with Don Douglas. This is a second model, the airmail, and uh, used the cabane struts, but they usually went back to the basic design and then they came out with a couple of other versions in the various Lockheed lines. The first of the Alphas, that's at the Burbank, using his multicellular wing and the, and, I mean, and the monocoque fuselage. This shows you the, the half of the fuselage, the lower half, and then there was a top half. Then in the wing, you had the multicellular structure, and those three cells, that's where the fuel tanks were. It was tanks that slid back into that, almost to the side of the fuselage. This again shows you side view. Once they assembled here on the right, you can see the, the total structure. This is a delta when we went to have six, seven passengers buried and put the pilot in the cabin. TWA had several of those. This is the Delta. This one was made for the Coast Guard. It uh, was also purchased by a division of Pan Am, and they flew from El Paso to Mexico City. Okay, this is a Gamma. Up in the front, there are two compartments right back of the engine. That's when they carry the airmail in the compartments separate from passenger airplanes. Jack Fry, who I had known when they were starting the company in out on 94th and Western, when it was called Aero Corporation of California. And um, I, Paul Richter, who was the chief pilot, and lived next door to us. And I used to ride out on Saturdays with him and sweep out the airplane. They were flying Falkers then, single engine, and then twice, then three engine and sweep out and wash windows and I get to ride on check flights. So, and then a little story about Jack Fry and, and Hughes. Uh, they would use the Gamma and set a record flying from Los Angeles to Newark. 
And the other one would tune his up a little bit and he'd shave a couple of minutes off. And we'd take his picture in the cockpit with his name alongside with the time. And the other one would set a record. And we did this back and forth about five or six times before it got monotonous. <laughs> now this is Mr. Northern's avion showing his first ideas about the flying wing. They flew this both as a tractor and as a pusher. And the cockpit was always remained the same. And the chief pilot on this was Eddie Belandi, who was an airline pilot, and a friend, a good friend of Mr. Northrop's. This is a couple of pictures of it on the ground and another one in flight. It's, this is when they're getting ready for the first flights and um, it's, the original film on this was shot by, I think it was Pathé News. And this was when they introduced Bert Balkan and Lincoln Ellsworth to the press out in front of the Moreland building looking over at Old Mines Field with the hangars. He took the north of Gamma and they used that to research down in the South Pole in the Antarctic. And unfortunately, the first time they got down there, they unloaded the airplane, got it all assembled, made their first flight, and they came in and landed. But unfortunately, there was a crack in the ice and was covered by snow. And when the airplane passed over, it sank down through the crack, tore one of the, the skis off, and damaged the propeller. They had to disassemble the wings and the airplane, and bring it 7,000 miles back to Hawthorne. We rebuilt the airplane and they went back. I think it was Christmas Day of 1935, they flew over the South Pole the first time. And this is the Navy BT-1. 50 of those were built for the Navy. This, like I say, was the first one to use the full retracting gear or partial retracting in this case. Then there was an experimental XFT-1, which was an, a fighter. The Navy did some work with that. These are the A-17As. We got a contract for 110 airplanes for one million, no, two million dollars for 110 airplanes. Um, you can see what your money was worth in 1936. <laughs> Then we upgraded and went to the A-17A, which had the full retracting gear. And of course, that increased the airspeed and the range on the airplane. And this is the same version going into international sales. This is a 3A, which was an Air Force experimental. Incidentally, that airplane, from the day that we cut the first metal until we started the engine, was 30 days. I, I had a picture I took from the balcony, looking down on that, and it looked like a sugar cube with a bunch of ants crawling all over it. You could hardly see the aeroplane for the people on it. It um, went back to Wright Field, and they wanted some things done. They brought it back. We modified the aeroplane, and the Lieutenant Cher was going to fly it back, and so, I had made arrangements for him to make a couple of passes, low-level passes, before he took off to go back east to right field. And um, on the th last pass, he went out over the coastline. This is out of Old Mines Field, and about where Inter Imperial Highway and the coast intersect. That's the last we saw of the airplane, and we never did find it. And they haven't to this day. This is the N3PB. This is the first one we built when they moved the plant over to Hawthorne. This is for the Norwegian government in exile. They sit down at uh, Lake Elsinore, and it was a very interesting group of Commander Utsby and about 16 pilots that escaped from Norway after the German occupation by stealing fishing boats and making their way to England, or actually in the morning when the German crew chief was starting up the engines, waiting for the pilots to come out, 
they would sneak over and conk him on the head and jump in the airplane and fly it to England, hoping they didn't get shot down because it had the German insignia on it. But they all survived and were part of this group. And they had 24 of these airplanes. They flew out of Iceland. They never had a hangar. They had to do all their work out on the ice and snow. And um, one of the airplanes was flying between two bases one day and he got caught in a snowstorm. He landed in the Toro River. And um, 37 years later, some people from Northrop and the Norwegian government and the Icelandic government found the wreckage of this thing. It, uh, what happened when he landed in the Tora River, the one float caught on the edge of a sandbar. So it was in the afternoon late, and they find there, the two guys that were in the airplane found their way to a farmhouse who put them up for the night. They went out the next morning, morning and the man had some mules, and so instead of trying to put a toe on the, at the float level, uh, they attached it to the propeller, and they pulled it, and they broke the engine mount. So it pulled the engine off, and the airplane sat there, and eventually this water and eddying around it sank in the river, and partly destroyed by pieces of ice floating down the river and hitting it and so on. And then 37 years later, the Norwegian government flew the airplane, what was left of it, back to Hawthorne. And after, I don't know, two and a half or three years, about 300 of us volunteered. And, and uh, we re rebuilt that airplane, not to flying status, but for ex exhibition. And when we had it ready to roll out, we invited people from the Norwegian Air Force. And very interesting, 11 of the pilots who are now flying for Scandinavian Airline all came to it, including the pilot that put the ship down in the river. And we had quite a, quite a little party there. And then Northrop got into this with radio plane. These are unmanned reconnaissance airplanes. These go back into late 30s. This is some of the, this is out at Metropolitan Airport, Van Nuys, some of the later ones. And then we'll go from those to the, the latest versions. This is the Global Hawk on the top. The little one in the front is one that was made for the Navy. We're flying that off our aircraft carriers. Both of these send back the information in real time, and then the command can determine what they want to do with that information. And this is the SNARK, the SM-62. This was our version of an intercontinental missile. It had a jet engine, and, but it had a navigation system. And on the top of it, over the center part of the fuselage, about the center of the wing, on the top was an optical window. And there were two ca cameras telescopes, and they also had a recording system that, depending on where they were launching from to whatever the target was, they, people would determine what main stars were going to be available at that time of the year, and they would make a tape that could not be destroyed by anybody flying around them or anything. They would, if they got overcast, the tape would take over and they would continue to fly. When they came to a clearing, the, the telescopes would pick up the stars that they were supposed to pick up at that point, because the airplane would be kept on the speed by the tape. And uh, we were able to fly from Cape Canaveral to uh, the Ascension Islands in the South Atlantic, and we could put uh, the nose portion of it from that white stripe on the nose, the one running around the fuselage, there were four attach points. They could automatically, when they reached that point, they had explosives. They would separate the nose, it would fall away, fins would come out, 
and it would go into a stabilized dive. And so many miles from the actual target, it would climb to a maximum altitude, and then the release would start. We were able to put one of the targets within a quarter of a mile, in 5,000 miles. So you didn't want to be any designated target there. So, but in doing all of that, we used to call it the snark-infested waters of Florida. <laughs> uh, this is when we were flying the snark down at uh, Almogordo. I used to have to borrow aeroplanes and pilots from some of the nearby bases, and we'd fly and escort on the snark missile. Had an interesting experience with that one time. We were flying alongside the snark, and we used to get spurious radio signals that caused a problem. And uh, we traced one of the signals when the airplane was sitting on the launching site, and all of a sudden the controls started flapping up and down. And they traced the signal, and it was coming from the Detroit police station. And another time, we got signals, and they were coming out of Mexico City. And so this one day, we were flying. We were about 32,000 feet, sitting at about 50 feet off the side of the snark wing. And they were watching the elevon on that, pulsing up and down. I was shooting movies of it. And I told the, the pilot, I said, just hold your position. I've got to change the film. It was a cloudless sky. I'm sitting there changing the film in the cockpit, and all of a sudden a shadow comes over the cockpit. That's strange. And I looked up. The snark is rolled over, and it's upside down, about 50 or 75 feet right over the top of us. The pilot thought that was part of the maneuver. <laughs> I, I grabbed the controls, dumped it forward, and kicked the rudder over. Scared the heck out of him. He tried to grab the control, and I said, stay off the controls. Let me, I and got away from there, because it was spinning and going off, and I went all the way into the ground, into actually some lava beds down there. And, and then finally, I was far enough away from it. I explained what had happened, and he thought I was supposed to do that. <laughs> but it, we would have probably ended up with it landing right on top of us, where it was going. But, as they say, all in the day's work. This is the F-89 twin jet. Those pods out on the wingtips. The forward part of the pod is, carries 52 rockets, 2.75 rockets. Then that portion of the rocket the nose was separated from the rest of it because that was a fuel tank, the rest of it. And it was a space spot this wide, separated the two and there was an armor plate and the flame from the rocket when it fired hit that and come deflected out to the side. I was on a flight one night when we fired a salvo, and we were warned not to look at the wingtip when that happened, but even looking straight ahead, your night blindness was totally destroyed. This shows a fire. You could do single fire, rapid fire, or salvos. And he had 104 rockets that you could sink battleships or anything else with it. I was in a T-33 out about 30 degrees out in front, a little bit above it, shooting back to, with a movie camera one time when we were firing. And one of the fins didn't open up, and the rocket came at us. Fortunately, it passed over the top of us about 30 feet. So. But it looked pretty serious there for a couple of seconds, I can tell you. <laughs> okay, this is in showing the assembly line in planted Hawthorne on the 89. There were many, many of those made and very good airplane. Here's the F-5. There were two versions, the single cockpit and the two cockpit. And we called them the A and B. 32 countries had air, F-5s. I had an interesting experience in the latter part of my term at Northrop, and they converted me back to engineering quality, engineering technology. And the first place I went was Vietnam. 
this was after the war supposedly was over. The armistice was signed in March of that year, and I went in on the 3rd of May. I went to a depot base at Benoit, and one month after I arrived there, at 5.30 in the morning, we got 95 rockets from one end of the base to the other, killed some people and destroyed some airplanes and set a fuel tank on fire. A month after that, in my living quarters, I was on the second floor at the base there, and there was a mountain about a mile away, which they had made a depot of storage of explosives and rockets and things like that. They got into the explosives and set off, I don't know how many tons of explosives, but a mile away, they blew the windows out of my room and threw the door in and they had to come with a crowbar to pry the door open to get me out. And this was all after the armistice was signed. But um, it got worse. I was at Pleiku, a base up on the Cambodian border and about 3.30 in the afternoon, I was out on the flight line and rockets started coming in and uh, you don't dare run in any, place, any direction because you don't know where they're gonna land. They had just brought in 10 Douglas A-1 attack airplanes and had the bombs all ready to put on them and rockets hit in the middle of all of that. I just laid down on the ramp out in the field and hope nothing hit close to me and as low a profile as I could get and watched airplanes get blown up. And unfortunately, it had been getting dangerous. Pleiku was on the, on the top of a, a mountain, there's a canyon off on the side and the, they were sneaking in down the canyon at night. So they started flying uh, airplanes at night with heat seekers on it they'd pick up an evidence that there were bodies moving down the canyon, and they'd come in and run down the canyon firing 30 and 50 caliber machine guns down the canyon. And so they decided to move the wives and the children of some of the Vietnamese Air Force people. They had them in a room there at the base waiting for the airplane to come in that afternoon to pick them up. A rocket hit in that building and killed about half of the women and children. And I, I stayed at a place in the little town of Pleiku on the second floor, and they'd be fighting at night. And fortunately, the building had a cement floor, and I would get out and lay on the floor, and again, keeping my profile as low as possible. And if any bullets came up, they'd rake a shower off of the bottom of the cement floor instead of coming up my room. So this was not necessarily adhering to the, to the armistice. Okay, and this is the F-20. This was an upgrade over the F-5. Unfortunately, we built three of them. They were, were taking the airplane to Paris for the air show, and uh, the pilot uh, was doing some rehearsing up, I think it was around Labrador or somewhere, and he ended up making a maneuver that got him in trouble and he crashed and killed him. And this is the DB-7. This was a result of the French in the beginning of the war came to us about an airplane. We developed a small airplane called a 7B, which was a twin engine attack airplane. It was highly classified and they were doing a demonstration at lunchtime. He was flying low and making low-level passes, and he made the last low-level pass. He turned, he had a feathered wood engine. He turned into the dead engine, and the airplane went into a flat spin at about 1,200 feet above the ground. Uh, Johnny Cable, who was a Douglas pilot, I got out, but he was falling at about the same rate the airplane was. He delayed opening his parachute too long, and there were five of us there at the hangar, and he came down, his, the chute just got almost out to where it was about ready to pop open, and his body hit the ground and bounced about 20 feet in the air, 
and the airplane crashed in the parking lot of North American. In those days, they didn't have cafeterias at the plant. People brought their lunch and sat out in their cars and ate lunch or whatever. And fortunately, it did not hit a car that had anybody having lunch in their car. But it, I think we paid for, I don't know, about 21 cars that were destroyed by a fire. And fortunately, the airplane, when it hit on top of the row of cars, uh, the fuselage back of the trailing edge of the wing partially broke off. And five of us ran over there and were able to pull this open enough. There was a Frenchman riding by this demonstration and all he got out of it was a broken leg. And of course, I'm sure it took a lot of years off of his life. <laughs> <laughs> and the A-20, that as a result grew out of the DB-7. And as you know, the A-20 was an excellent aircraft and then Douglas inherited this whole program. And out of this airplane, then you came the A-20 and then the A-26. So Douglas inherited that, and then the BT-1 that we were talking about, the Navy wanted an upgrade on that. We talked about it earlier. They, we did, came up with a BT-2, and then the war started, and Douglas got that, and that became the Dauntless. And we did some work on that and put the leading edge slot under the wing so that you could air control the airflow over the outer aileron for the carrier approach. We demonstrated the Navy, after we finished with our work on that, that you come in like you were making a carrier approach, you could rotate the thing about 35 degrees. And you couldn't have done that without that modification that we put in there. This is the DC-4, old mines field. I flew in it and did the recording of a lot of the test data it started out with a triple tail like the Lockheed Electra used to have, but when they finally started producing them, they went to a single vertical tail. That's in flight. The two engines on this side are feathered. They're flying on two engine. That canal down there is the Bologna Creek, Creek Canal. And then we had this concept, the DC-5, and it was a twin engine transport we also thought it might be used for parachuting, but uh, the engines were too close in, and the blast from the propeller caused some of them to tumble. They decided against it. But a KLM did buy some of them and used them down in the Indian Ocean and in that area. Actually, when the war started, when the Japanese were hitting the uh, Philippines in that area, they were using these airplanes down there to fly people out to Australia to get them away from the danger zone. Oh, here's Mr. Northrop and Moy Stevens and the little flying N1. They flew that in various configurations. They had it with a droop wingtips. We flew it in different um, dihedrals, and then we took and found that we didn't need any of that, just straight wing. This is up at um, uh, Roseman Dry Lake. This little one made its first flight in 1940. We built um, three airplanes called the N9M, which you'll see shortly. Three of them in formation. Okay. It's 72 foot wingspan and it had uh, twin Manascos. It's a B-35. It's a 172 foot wingspan and had 15-foot counter-rotating propellers. And when, uh, later we'll see the conversion into the B-49. That's on the flight from Hawthorne to um, what became Edwards Air Force Base. Well, this is B-49. This flight, we were running a test of the coastal defense 
up at San Francisco. They knew that we were going to um, run the test in a given week. They didn't know whether it would be night or day or what. So we've got north of uh, flight engineers, two or three pilots, myself, and um, a representative from Wright Field. We took off from Edwards Air Force Base and went over Half Moon Bay just south of San Francisco at about 42,000. And radio silence, flew a 100 mile figure eight, no, no interception. We flew another 100 mile figure eight, nothing. We broke the radio silence and asked them to give us a position. It took them five minutes after they knew we were at, at the area. So they came, before they gave us one, we don't know what, but they went out and looked at the contrail and, <laughs> and made the determination. But um, they flew one of these, I didn't go on the flight, but they flew from Edwards Air Force Base to Washington, D.C non-stop, non-refueled in four hours and five minutes in 1948. I've been in it about that same time at almost 50,000 feet at 500 miles an hour. It's quite an airplane. You want to know if I was in the 49 when they made the flight, the last flight? Yes, I was. There was so much politics involved at that time between this airplane and the B-36. And um, strangely enough, one of the five that just, of us who used to work at Northrop and were flying all these airplanes, uh, they four of them went to work for American Airlines and then two of them left American Airlines and went to work for Consolidated. And then one of them ended up was the chief test pilot on the B-36. And his parents lived here in Culver City and he'd come up to visit them and he and I get together and compare notes and one thing and another. So I was privileged with my mouth sh keeping shut and some of the problems they were having with the B-36 during that time. And one, I'll tell you one other story. Um, after World War II, they had uh, the first defense day and uh, we were invited to come up to McClellan Field by Sacramento and make three passes. So we went up, we made our two passes, and on a downwind, we get ready for our third pass, we heard the B-36 from Carswell in Texas calling for permission to make their first pass. So we, we requested permission to follow the B-36. They came in at about 3,000 feet. We came in at about Oh, 1,000 or 1,500 behind them. And when they got to the end of the field, they started to pull up. And I was in the back in this blister up here in the back. And we're pulling up. We went underneath them, started our pull up. We rolled out at about between six and 7,000 feet. They're still about 3,500 feet chugging away here. <laughs> and we were chastised for making them look bad. <laughs> Then they, we came down here and made three passes over Burbank, down over Hollywood, and then out to March Field. And a friend of mine was the flight safety officer out there at that time, and uh, talking to him afterwards, he said, well, when the B-36 made their announcement they were coming in, they didn't need to announce. We could hear it for 15 minutes before it was even in sight. And he said when they announced that the B-49 was on final approach uh, for the pass. We couldn't see it. There was a little bit of haze, and it was already over the fence and about a third of the way down the field before some of the people actually could see the airplane, and it wasn't making any noise. The thing that really gave us away in some cases was the four eight jet engines put out a little smoke, so you can get a little bit of a smoke trail. But uh, he said, they didn't know it need to tell us. We waited and we waited. And all of a sudden here the thing is right over the field before we realize it. But it was an interesting airplane to work with and to fly with. And when we were ordered to cut them up, destroy them, uh, we brought, I think it was 11 of them out of the plant that were 
within a few hundred or thousand hours of ready to fly, and they lined them up on the, the ramp there. I got one of the pilots, and we went up, and I took pictures to show, because all the publicity was showing that we didn't have airplanes, only had built four or five airplanes and so on. We had four flying at Miroc, one out at Ontario, and these 11 that were sitting on the line at North Arn, and I never, we had to take cutting torches and cut them up to salvage the aluminum. And uh, <clears throat> I've never seen so many grown men cry and so many tears shed as there was that day. That's the takeoff, the first takeoff of the B-49 at Hawthorne. I was in a P-61 above following, following on the takeoff with the movie camera up at top. And then we escorted it going up to Muroc. This is on the way up out there over the desert. This picture with Mr. Northrop is after they arrived at Muroc. He was up there and to greet the crew of the airplane. This is the RB. With three engines buried in the wing and then one on each side in the pod. It, uh, of course, didn't go anywhere because everything got canceled after that. Uh, that's just looking up the tailpipe and starting up. Each one of those jet engines only put out 4,000 pounds of thrust in those days, but it still was the most powerful flying airplane that, uh, in its day. I got out on the wing and laid down and I were taxiing and shooting that picture. This one, I had a camera set up on this line there and we worked out a thing with the pilot so that they would come down we'd get this head off, that shot taken on takeoff. The instructions was if he got off to the side of the line, we'd knock the camera off and roll out so we'd be between the, the nose wheel and the main gear. Mm -hmm. This is taken out of that back tail gun position of the B-25. When the, the B-49 that crashed and killed the Air Force team there that Captain Edwards was in, they, we were able to prove afterwards, taking the survey of the damage of the airplane that crashed and what they had reported through the tower. See, they had been doing their own testing, and they kept everything secret. They kept their briefcases with them on the airplanes and everything, so a lot of their data was lost in the fire. <clears throat> but they apparently had reported in to the tower that they were finished with the test and they would be in shortly. An hour later, they crashed. But they apparently were playing around and doing some stall tests and they were probably, we put everything together, we judged that they were probably about 10,000 feet. Well, that meant that they were only about, um, um, had less than maybe six to 7,000 feet because the terrain is about 2,500 to 4,000 feet, depending on where you are there. And um, they got into this, the airplane apparently went into a, a, either a spin or into a dive, and it accelerates very rapidly, of course. It's a very clean airplane. And they pulled it out so sharply that 30 feet of the right and left wingtips apparently failed simultaneously, and it caused the rest of it to tumble. And a couple of the crew with the old heavy crash helmets that they used to have in those days the weight of their head plus the weight of the helmet, actually two of the heads were snapped almost off of their body. And we went out afterwards and we took the pilot and the flight engineer in the 49. We went over on the east side of the lake at 25,000 feet and um, they proceeded to do the stalls. And, they, and we were flying off to their side at about a 45 degree behind them, so we could watch the whole scene. I was photographing it. They pulled it up, kept increasing it, increasing it, till it stalled. actually went into a stall. It rolled over to the right, went over, and 
And when it once got its nose down, it was accelerating very rapidly. We couldn't even dive fast enough to stay with it. But it took them 12,000 feet to pull the airplane out safely. And after we'd done that about two or three times, they radioed down to the ground and asked if they wanted them to repeat any of the tests. And they said, uh, no, bring the plane in. We want to check it, see if there's any structural damage done. Because we did, with the flaps fully retracted and also with flaps extended. And, but there was found note to be the way they brought it out. It, Took them a long time to pull it out gradually, but there was no damage to the airplane whatsoever. So we pretty well knew that they had been too low and got panicked when they were accelerating so fast and pulled it out. And that's what caused the whole thing to come apart. But it's just one of those unfortunate things that you learn by experience. The P-61, was a famous airplane of the World War II. It's called the Black Widow. It had a turret with four 50s in it, and in the belly there were four 20s firing forward. And you had, and the nose was radar, and uh, you could pick up an airplane or a fleet of airplanes with a radar, and it'd sneak up behind them with using the radar, and turn loose with all eight guns on them, and. Before they knew it, you'd knocked about two-thirds of their formation out. And when the Germans were sending the rockets across the channel into England, they would fly out and use a radar and pick these things up and fire and explode the rocket and then try to get out of the way of the debris. I saw gun camera films of some of them, and a few of them got some damage from some of the debris. But then, um, it was an excellent airplane. Uh, John Myers, who was a chief test pilot on it, um, uh, used to make a demonstration to prove that it was a fighter plane. People would get assigned to it. They had applied for fighters. They'd get assigned to it. They'd come out and see this big airplane. And, oh, I wanted a fighter plane. And John would go out, take and put him in the seat in front with a gunner right behind him. He'd fly a demonstration, making a low level pass with both engines. And then he'd come back again, cut, cut one engine off, make a pass, and then roll into the dead engine, make two or three rolls, and then pull up. And he made some believers out of them as to what this airplane could do. We've developed a photo recon airplane after the war modified the 61, and uh, we had a total camera situation. We had a 40-inch vertical and a trimetrogon system, which meant that we could shoot from horizon to horizon in a forward of like, and we could shoot about 35 degrees down. The Air Force mapped uh, some of Japan, all of the Philippines, and several other parts, some parts of China, and, who was the Northrop employee that bailed out of a P-61? Where's the Northrop employee? <laughs> uh, that was me. I'll tell you the story about that. We were on that first flight of the B-49, and um, we were underneath. We were just flying over my ball day at about 14,000 feet, and uh, we were underneath the B-49 about 75 feet, and we were checking the landing gear and some other things and talking to the crew in the B-49. And the Captain Walton was flying a P-80 over on the right wing of the 49. And he came in on our radio and he said, um, it looks like you fellas might have a fire. A very casual voice. We checked the instrument panel and everything and there was no indication of a fire. We went ahead doing our thing. And that must have been a couple of minutes later, he came back on the radio and he said, for Christ's sake, your airplane's burning up. <laughs> well, they sounded pretty convincing, and I don't know what made me do it, but I looked down at the number two engine, and there was fluid running out of, just ahead of the firewall, like somebody was pouring water out of a bucket, and it turned out it was 100 octane fuel, 
running down into the exhaust. This was a C model B61, and you had the exhaust and the supercharger right there. And this raw fluid was then flowing back, and some of it was getting sucked up into the wheel well and down the boom. And I looked down the boom, and part of the boom was melting and falling off, and part of the tail was on fire. And uh, then I looked over at the pilot, and he always used to say that the parachute was just a cushion to sit on. And this day he was sitting on the cushion and the harness was hanging over the back of the seat. And, and he had a, a heavy flight jacket on and he couldn't reach and take around to get the harness. And I, this was on the first flight we were supposed to be doing the 49, you know. And I was shooting for Northrop and also for five newsreel companies. And I had a, a whole bunch of cameras switching back and forth. And uh, so I saw the situation he was in. I got rid of the cameras. I crawled up. I was in the front gunner's seat. And I crawled up to him. I had to get a hold of something. I had to hold on to keep from rattling like a pea in a pod because we're now falling out of the sky. And um, while I that, to get a hold of the harness and be able to pull enough slack to get his shoulders into it, see? Well, we lost about um, 7,000 feet of the 14,000 feet and finally got him in the harness and after several tries and then we didn't have enough forward airspeed when he pulled the release for the canopy over the cockpit, it wouldn't come off. It flopped up and down and racked him on the knuckles a few times and he finally was able to get a hold of it and push it over the side. So now he's got his parachute, he's, he's standing up with one foot in the seat, his seat, and one foot on the floor and hanging onto the windshield and I motioned that I was going to go out. I had made a movie for the Air Force, well, that's, I don't know, six, six or eight months before, how to bail out of the 61 at three different stations. We'd done some wind tunnel tests with little dummies and one thing or another, and I had decided if I had to go out of that position where I was in the gunner station, <coughs> excuse me, I was going to try to go out over the, behind the engine the cell, under the wing, and that would slide me out beyond the boom, and then open my parachute, and I got clear. And uh, so I did that, I dove out, went on the, just the inner wing, just the edge of the nacelle, and hit the wing, and it was, didn't seem like I was going anywhere, at first, and pretty soon my feet slid around, and then my goggles had flown up, and one lens was broken, and it was three pieces of my lens was sliding off the wing, and I wasn't even going anywhere. But, but all of a sudden, I started sliding, and I did get outside of the boom, and got my hand in the ripcord, and fortunately, with my previous parachute experience, I knew how to use the parachute properly. And uh, I uh, waited until I was clear, pulled the ripcord, the chute opened, I wrapping up the ripcord to stick it in my jacket, and I found that when I slid across this part of the wing, it was molten. And well, that uh, fire had gone up into the wheel well and on this part of the wing that I was going out on. And I had burnt paint and molten aluminum from my helmet to my shoes. And, but anyway, I was, my chute was open and everything was fine, so that's a little color. <laughs> so uh, then the next thing that we had as a challenge, the Boulder Dam power line running from Victorville up into Mint Canyon was right below us. And uh, I, of course, with my parachuting experience, I knew how to slip the chute and do things but, uh, and I was able to slip my chute and I landed about 100 feet to the side of the power line. The wreckage of the airplane hit about 200 feet on the other side of the power line and the pilot hit about 100 feet from the wreckage. The third person in it had gotten out earlier and was up the hill about a quarter of a mile from where we were. 
Fortunately, all of us did get out okay, and nobody had any serious injuries, anything. But um, my, incidentally, my wife wasn't working, and somebody at the plant thought they were doing a favor, and they called her up and asked if she was listening to the radio, and she said no. They said, well, there's been an accident, and the plane that I was in crashed, and that they said there were three people in it, but they only saw two parachutes. And so she didn't know for about five hours that everybody did get out. So when I came home, she said, well, I thank God that he still has some work for you to do. So I guess I'm still working on it. <laughs> I had a still camera, I had a 16 millimeter, and I had three cameras for the newsreel people when the airplane eventually ended up upside down. And the cameras were scattered out on the ground. And you know, you're, we were about 35 miles east of Palmdale out there in the desert. In those days, there was nothing out there, and except that power line. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> within an hour, there were probably 100 people all around that, where we were. And uh, some of them had found cameras and one thing or another. They opened the cameras that were still intact and stretched the film out around on plants to keep supposed people from getting too close to the wreckage. So all, all of the film that I had shot was used as ropes around the wreckage. This is the B-2. This is probably the most sophisticated airplane flying today. It's almost an impossible airplane to see and detect by radar because when you're at the altitude, it's not a very much reflective surface. Of course, Mr. Northrop, fortunately, they, before he passed away, they were able to show him the drawings of the B-2 and a model of it. And he, when he saw that, he said, now I know why the good Lord has kept me alive all these years. I thank you very much. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.